A young lady was in her first year of teaching first graders. On the last day of school before Christmas, the kids all lined up to give her presents. The first student gave her a small box. Well, she shook it and heard some small things rattling inside. Knowing that the child's father owned a candy store, she said, I know what's in this box. It's a box of chocolate. Yes, teacher, it's candy. She took the box from the next student. It was thin and it was long, and his father owned a flower shop. So she said, I know what's in this box. It's flowers. You gave me flowers. Yes, teacher, it's a bunch of flowers. The next student handed her a tall box. His father owned a local liquor store. And this box was leaking. She tested it and said, I know what's in this. Is, what's in this? It's champagne. No. Well, she tested it again. Well, then it's wine. No, the boy said, it's a puppy. You know, we all sometimes get some goofy gifts, don't we, for Christmas? We really do. When one contemplates Christmas in our culture, there are some pretty weird things that we do. So on the second Sunday at Advent, our focus this morning, uh, as you've read the scripture, is on angels' plea for peace. Angels' plea for peace. See, angels appear more than half of the books in the Bible. Did you realize that? With over 300 total references about angels. They have three primary responsibilities, though. The first one is this. They magnify God. The number one job of angels is to adore God. It says in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, these words, you give life to everything, and the multitude of heaven worship you. Then according to Job chapter 38, verse 7, at creation, it says, The morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. And secondly, they are messages of God. So first they magnify God, then they are messages of God. Now the word angel, as used in the Bible, literally means messenger. Messenger. Their job is to do what God sends them to do. Angel messages basically convey two types of message. Sometimes it's good news like announcing the birth of Christ, but other times they bring bad news. When they serve in this capacity, they are not cute and cuddly cherubim dolls that we put on top of our Christmas tree. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 says, This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. The book of Revelation is full of avenging angels. And it is anything but pretty. Also, they minister to people. That's the third thing they do. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, puts it best. Here's what it says. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? See, most of the time, angels are not seen. They minister invisibly behind the scenes. And yet, on occasions, they break into our world, appearing for a short time to accomplish a specific purpose that God sent them to do. The Bible mentions that when they do appear, they often look just like humans. Look around. There could be an angel here. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. It says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. See, it is impossible to read the Christmas story without understanding a little about angels because it begins and ends with them. 
The incarnation is so incredible and so earth-shaking that only angels could be entrusted by God to be the appropriate messengers. No earthly channels or communications could be relied upon to get this amazing message out because no human person can possibly do that kind of work. One interesting point to be made is that if you were to look at all the major events in the Bible, there is no other occurrence that has any, or maybe as many, I should say, as many messengers and message from so many angelic messengers. Remembering that 400 years had gone by when God was silent between the end of what Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. People have been pleading with God, though, to come down into this world with words similar to what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1, when it said, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. So let me just make some observations about angels in the Christmas story. First is this. Angels appear suddenly to ordinary people doing ordinary things. Angels don't come with an announcement beforehand. See, actually they come bearing an announcement and they often break into our world unexpectedly with their messages of great proportions. Secondly, angels cause people to be afraid. When an angel appears in Scripture, a sense of fear and wonder blasts through. This awesome inspiring element was built into the very worship fabric of ancient Israel. The Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim carved into it. Prophets like Isaiah came face to face with seraphims who cried out, when he cried out in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. With the doorpost shaking and a temple filled with smoke, Isaiah cried out in fear. He cried out, Woe is me. Knowing they have this kind of effect on humans, some of their first words are, What? Do not be afraid. When an angel appears, you always hear in text, we'll look at some, do not be afraid. See, angels are never to be adored. Every reference to angels in the Bible is incidental to some other topic. We need to be careful not to give them too much attention. Because Psalm 103, verse 20 says that they are mighty ones who do his bidding. See, we are never told to seek out encounters with angels. And they refuse, remember this, they refuse to be worshipped. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9, Apostle John is overcome by all that he had heard and seen. He said this in that text, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel, but he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. See, good angels never draw attention to themselves. Never. The Bible makes that clear. They can get our attention, but they always do it for God's sake, not for their own. When biblical angels discharge their duty and deliver their tidings, they withdraw from human contact. They're gone. They don't stay long because they don't want us to focus on them as people do today. They want us to worship God. One other thought in this regard. Angels are not to be prayed to. They may help deliver answers to prayer, but the Bible never suggests anywhere in the Bible that I can find that we should direct our requests in prayer to them. Now I'd like us to look at how four Christmas characters responded to the angelic encounters. See, in one of the earliest 
recorded Christmas carols found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we read these words. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body and was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. See, we know that angels were present at Jesus' temptation, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in his resurrection, in his ascension, and they will accompany him at the second advent. And angels were very involved during the first advent. So let's look at four different reactions to these early angelic encounters in Matthew and Luke. First reaction was this, denied and doubted. In Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, it's the first appearance of angel in the gospel accounts takes place in the opening verses of Luke. When Gabriel, one of the only two named angels in the Bible, and the other one is who? Michael, right? That's the only two named in the Bible. Well, it appears anyway. Gabriel is one, they appear to Zechariah. We studied that last week, I believe. To tell him that he and his wife Elizabeth were going to have a son named John. That's in Luke chapter 1, verse 7. And it indicates that they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Zechariah was a priest and when it was his turn to serve in the temple, to burn incense, the angel of the Lord appeared in verse 12, tells us that he was gripped with fear. The angel confronted him and said in verse 13, what? Do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you'll give him the name John, and that's John the Baptist. The angel then proceeded to describe what kind of person he would be as well as his purpose, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was John the Baptist's call by God, to make people ready and be prepared for the Lord's coming. Even though Zechariah had been praying for a child, and even though he was a religious guy, he denied and he doubted. It says in verse 18, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, my wife is well along in years. So because of his doubts, he is made dumb, literally. Right? And is not able to speak until that baby is born. And Luke chapter 1, verse 64 tells us that when he was finally able to speak, Eight days after John's, the Baptist's birth, the first thing he did was to praise God. He then breaks into a song with these opening lyrics in verse 68. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. The song ends with an allusion in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Also, you read these words. To shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Now, second reaction, not sure, but surrendered. If you turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, in the next in angel encounter, Gabriel appears to a virgin named, what, Mary. After giving a reading, Mary is greatly troubled, and so... We hear these words of comfort once again. Do not be afraid, the angel says. Do not be afraid. Mary is then told that she will be pregnant, give birth to a son, and she is to give him the name Jesus. And in verse 32 of that text, Gabriel tells her a little about the baby she will give birth to, where he says he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. While Zechariah denied and doubted when he heard the amazing news, right, from the angel, Mary was simply not sure how all this would happen when she asked in verse 34, how will this be? How will this be since I am a virgin? After Gabriel gives her a few more details, that must have been very difficult for a teenager to comprehend. 
Mary's response with the heart of a servant in verse 38, though. She says this, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. See, Mary wasn't sure how it was all going to work out, but she did one thing wonderful. She surrendered anyway. She surrendered. Then the third reaction, accepted and acted. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, Joseph named some divine intervention after he found out Mary was pregnant because he knew he wasn't the father. His reputation was on the line. I mean, what was he going to do? Because he was a righteous man, he determined to end engagements as quietly as he could and quickly. In the middle of his misery, Joseph gets a visit from an angel. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, it says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you ought to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. This unnamed angel fills in some of the blanks for Joseph. But first he settles Joseph's anxious heart by saying, do not be afraid. Amazingly, he's being asked to raise a child that is not his. And he's given a glimpse of the glory of this child as the angel tells him that this boy will be the savior, fulfilling the prophecy of a sure sign. From Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Joseph immediately accepts his assignment and acts on it when he, we read this in that verse. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Now, if you look at the Bible, Joseph actually had two more encounters with angels several months later. And like the first time, he accepted the messages and the message and acted on them. If you looked in the Bible at Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, it says, One day the wise men had gone, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in dream. He said, Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left Egypt. Then Joseph had some get up and go, didn't he? His response was identical. Sometime later, another angel encounter in which he was told to go back to Israel because Herod now had died. And so we see his obedience again. So what does he do? So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. So Zechariah denied and doubted. Mary wasn't sure, but she surrendered and Joseph accepted and acted. Now there's one more reaction. The fourth reaction, believe and broadcast. The final exhibit of an angel intervention takes place when God rocks the routine of some guys. You know, a bunch of guys who are just out there doing their job. You find out in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. In the midst of the mandine, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared. Into the darkness of a silent night came the brightness of the glory of the Lord. I'm sure they were rubbing their eyes and shaking their sand in their sandals. They were afraid. In fact, the word terrified means that they were alarmed frightened. We'll study more about, I believe, shepherds next Sunday. But the angel said to them, what? Do not be afraid. Once again, the angel has to tell humans to chill out. Don't be afraid. The reason they did not need to be afraid is because the messenger was bringing good news of great joy that would be for all people. Because it said, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. 
So as the shepherds are trying to handle the message from this one messenger, this one angel, they're taken aback again in verse 13. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God. The word suddenly means that the heavenly host came unexpectedly without any warning. The phrase great company means that there were so many that it was impossible to count the vast array of angels. That's how many there were. The sky was filled with a multitude of mighty messengers. The phrase heavenly host refers to the Lord's army and other passages of scripture. Because, well, if you go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, I'll stop there for a moment. That's why I do an outline. I gave you lots and lots of scripture on your own time to read, and you'll know more and more about the purpose of angels. Anyway, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Then the Lord opened the servants' eyes and looked, and they saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. The shepherds watched as heaven opened up and literally saw an entire army of messengers, hundreds and thousands of angel warriors worshiping God. By the way, while angels do sing in other instances, this time they say it in verse 14. It, they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Notice that peace comes only after praising. We must put God and his glory first, and then peace will come. In everyday life, that's what it's about. First, put God, and then peace will come. While this is a neat time of the year, there is nothing magical about this season if one does not know the Christ of Christmas. The phrase happy holidays, do you hear that? You know what? It's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless without an acknowledgement of the holiness of God. After witnessing this incredible display of unbridled adoration and praise, the shepherds knew that they had to move. They couldn't stay there. Verse 15, when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They discussed what they should do and were unanimous in their decision to do what? Head to Bethlehem. And I love verse 16, because it shows that their fear had been replaced with faith. And then their faith went to their feet. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and a baby who was lying in a manger. I mean, with those shepherds, there was no delay. The word hurry carries with the idea of speed. I mean, they were going. It was no small matter for them to leave their sheep behind because they could have lost their jaws by leaving them unintended. So the shepherds then became messengers of the message. They had received from the angel a message. Verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So with hearts full of gratitude, these men broke out into praise in verse 20. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told by the angels. You know, there are angels everywhere, and I believe they are still doing God's work today. But whether we see or hear an angel doesn't really matter. See, what matters most is that we get God's message and that we respond to it. That's what matters. Which Christmas character most represents where you and I are today? Are you denying 
and doubting? Don't be like Zachariah and, and allows your doubts to delay a decision. Did you know that angels are very curious about Christmas? In fact, they have studied salvation and are amazed by it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, Even angels, even angels long to look into these things. See, angels don't understand everything about redemption because they can't experience it. But my guess is that they're dumbfounded when people deny it and doubt it. See, ask God to display your doubts. Study the scriptures to be open to the supernatural. Wise men still follow him. Dumb people don't. They don't. Are you a bit uncertain but ready to surrender to the Lord? Are you? Mary wasn't sure about everything, but what did she do? She surrendered anyway. And Luke chapter 2, verse 11 says that a Savior is born to you. See, Christmas must become personal. Have you personally received him, even if you're a bit uncertain right now? Has he? Look at your heart. When you repent and receive all that Jesus has for you. Luke chapter 15, verse 10, tells us that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. So if you repent, who's rejoicing? Angels. The angels are ready to throw a party on your behalf. But you must first receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Confess your sins, invite them into your life. So I always have the question, will you do that right now? For those who do not know Jesus, will you? I, I don't know how you celebrate Christmas without them. I love to ask people that. I was sitting in the mall while my wife shops. You know, I just sit <laughs> five, six hours now. No, just a little while. And I sat this time in other years right next to Santa Claus. And I'm thinking and praying. And I'm saying, watching these beautiful little children and their parents coming up to see Santa Claus. And I'm saying to myself, look, why? Why? And then I picture Santa Claus gone and Jesus sitting there. And what does the Bible say? He says to the children, come unto me. Come unto me. I think of that often. Friends, heaven is now open, but it won't stay that way forever, you know. In John chapter 1, verse 51, it says, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. See, on a harder Christmas is a gift heralded by the angels. It's a present that must be received, a gift that must be open. Just listen to this little poem that I discovered. It's called My Gift. What could I give him poor as I am? If I was a shepherd, I'd give him my lamb. If I was a wise man, I would do my part. What can I give him? I'll give him my heart. So I ask you, are you ready to ex accept and act? You know, Joseph is a good model of someone who put feet to his faith. What is God asking you to do right now?
Are you putting feet to your faith? You know, I wish you all could have been here for Sunday school. There were some testimonies given. And my heart was crying out to myself. I love to give testimony and how the Lord saved me. But there's more to that even. What am I doing for the Lord? The Bible tells me I should go into the world and what? Preach the gospel. Share the love of Jesus Christ. Put feet to my faith. That's what we're not doing this Christmas. I believe in my heart. So what is God asking you to do right now? No matter how difficult it is, and it's difficult to talk about the Lord or give you testimony. It's scary. But the Holy Spirit will do it for you. I found that out. So no matter how difficult it is, if God is telling you to do it, that's what you need to do. And that's what God's telling us to do it as believers in Christ. Share the gospel this Christmas. Think about that. Do you believe and will you broadcast the good news? We have so many opportunities doing this wonderful birth of Jesus Christ through wonderful cards with even tracks put in it with the gospel message, what it's all about, and to share. Have you ever noticed the middle letters in the word evangelism? Have you ever looked at that and what they are? If you can spell, I can't, but anybody who can. Have you ever looked at it? Do you see the word? Angel. Angel. Angel there. See, we are called to believe and broadcast the good news. Now, just like the angels did back then. That's what I was sharing about angels. The good news they were sharing, what they were doing. And don't be like the angel and say, but I'm afraid. So the shepherds communicated the Christmas story. And we are now the messengers of the manger story, aren't we? We're the messengers of the manger story. Who can you point to the Savior this season? Have you prayed about that? Invite a friend to church here. How about to our Christmas Eve service? How about a special note to a neighbor or friend with the Christmas story, the true story of Jesus Christ and what he means to you and I? So, Father, we just thank you for your holy word. We thank you for angels, Lord. And, Lord, you laid on my heart. Don't depend on angels as I pray to them or I honor them. Or I, they have a job to do, and they have completed it and continue each day to complete it. And I've been called. All Christians who love Christ as Lord and Savior have been called to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to all. Lord, I pray for that burden to be on the heart of the people here this morning. Take the fear out and give them the courage to share. And what a blessing that will be. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.